listening to the cover you put out a couple of days back yeah of samia what does reworking other people's songs kind of teach you about your own creative voice because you obviously did the national as well back in march now we while back yeah i mean i guess doing like covers and reimaginings of other songs it's just like a really low pressure environment for me to try something new you know and i guess like something i, I like about it is more people have been asking me to like not do remixes but just like redo their song so like you know like the samia song like i don't use any stems of of hers i just like rearrange and like do my own thing and that's always that's a lot of fun for me to like take someone else's like words and their like vibe and reinterpret it and and try some things that i may be thinking about trying um and just to see if it works and to see how people react to it and you know i think it's fun like i of course try not to like overdo it and do too many but it's it's a really like like i said low pressure fun way to try like a new process or a new like tracking workflow or new synths or new drum machine you know that's like kind of where i like i try stuff <laughs> is on those things <laughs> and with the national um ep like you know me and my boys like we just you know we were just like yeah let's try like we tried everything you know like every song is like pretty different on there um but you know i think it makes those those things special and kind of like one off because i'll probably not do anything like that like those again you know it's just like like a little snapshot of wherever i am in my like studio workflow and <laughs> at the time you know it's pretty cool yeah i mean i guess it's the same as any song it's like a stamp in time of where you were at that moment and kind of just captures that definitely how much then would like of the success of a song is down to the song itself and how much is down to the performer it's like that kind of age-old thing you know if you took the beatles songs and someone else sang them would they have been as big as they were what do you kind of feel the ratio is there oh i don't know i mean i think the song is everything like i mean you need basic things for the song to do good like <laughs> you have like you have to have a, a good singer or at least an interesting vocalist you know um the instruments have to be played well but I think if an arrangement is is excellent and it's well produced, a song can be great, you know. Um that's why karaoke is fun. <laughs> like, you know, like the song is great, it doesn't matter who sings it a lot of times. Yeah, that's kind of been my like operating philosophy over the last few years is like finding like the song within the song, like understanding what makes the song great and like amplifying that. Whether it's a vocal hook, whether it's a drum sound, whether it's a synth line, like knowing what is special about the song and capturing that and like putting it in a place where everyone can see it and feel it the way you do is like almost more important than who's singing the song in my opinion so is that something you map out before you go into recording or is that something you start to work out as you're recording it and kind of playing around with it it depends some songs i have like a really clear vision for like um when i'm writing i may know exactly where i want to go or exactly what vibe i'm trying to chase but for the most part like I write on an acoustic guitar or like a synth piano, like a piano. And once I record it, I start immediately thinking about like the sounds and my like arsenal of sounds that will like be interesting to include in that song. Um, and I think Mustang on the record is like a good example of that. Like that song is like kind of like a country shuffle. Like if you ever see me play it acoustically, if you hear like the recorded version of the song, the synths like stand out in a huge way. And I felt like that synth sound, I mean, it's like eight different synths layered with like varying types of like delays and granular reverbs and stuff. And like, it, it creates like a memorable, but like unique cutting sound, you know? So I, I feel like in every song that I do, I'm trying to find like a sonic element to like wrap the song around. Um, in Boomer, I, I, you know, Boomer is like a rap song and, you know, I wanted to like feature the voice, you know, and be like, I want to make the voice sound like cutting and interesting and reminiscent of a rap, you know, like a da baby song or like, you know, something that really has like a, like a, like a, like a great, like vocal feeling on the ears. Um, but yeah, you know, <laughs> for every song is different, but that's normally how I approach it. It's interesting you mentioned those two, because they kind of serve as, you know, nice examples of the fact that you're utilizing like a lot 
of different kind of vocal styles on this record. You're kind of tapping into a lot of different things and kind of are you tapping into something different in you for each one and how do you kind of find the correct voice for a song and is that something that maybe takes a little bit of time or is it very much there from the off? Um, I mean, I just kind of do what the song is asking for. Um, and I've, I kind of, I grew up playing all of these things, you know, grew up in hardcore bands, played in country bands, made a lot of beats for a lot of rappers. Like it just, you know, I like, I love making music and whenever I'm like on a vibe, I can, I just feel it. I'm like, oh, like, I'll be like, yo, let's write like a house song, like Flage God. Like, I know what that sounds like. I know what the vocals should sound like. You know, like, I know the vibe. I've made that song a thousand times, you know, or like with like um, Far, like a way more like stripped down, like, you know, acoustic vibe. You know, it's like I have listened to a lot of Americana artists and, you know, put out a lot of like little folk records, <laughs> you know, before this. So I, I felt very comfortable doing it and once I start writing it I, I know where it needs to go you know so that's kind of I don't know it's like instincts and just like using your ears and doing it a bunch you know in your room alone and then you know everything just kind of feels comfortable I feel like I can move between things because I've like done it a bunch of times <laughs> yeah were you a singer before you were a songwriter or were you did you kind of was songwriting you kind of window into singing? Yeah, I mean I've always been a singer. Um my mom is an opera singer and I grew up watching her sing and you know, we were in church a lot. I sang in church a lot. Um and I was kinda late to like join a band or really take music super seriously, but it was a huge part of my life. As soon as I like fell in love with guitar playing, I, I started writing songs really fast. Um, guitar is just like really clicked with me. Do you still go to church now? No, I don't. No, <laughs> I don't. But you know, I'd, I'd I'd go sing at a church again if I got asked. When you're performing in church and singing, how does the are you kind of connecting with the people you're singing with in the same way that you connect when you're performing with a band, or is it a different thing? That's a good question because like when I was younger, like my parent, my mom was very religious. You know, my parents were. And, you know, we didn't listen to the radio. Like, we weren't allowed to really listen to secular music for a, a long time. When I was a kid, like, young, growing up. And I remember, you know, like, in, in black church, like, in the South, and, in, you know, across the world, you know, when things pick up and, like, the Holy Spirit starts moving, like, you feel the vibe shift in the church when the band is playing, you know, and everyone's hooting and hollering and running through the aisles. And, you know, there's a thing that happens when the band, like, lifts off. And I remember being in middle school and someone taking me to like a hardcore show and I remember it was like the first show I'd ever been to that wasn't like in an opera house or a church or some like family friendly like concert space and I just remember feeling like yo this feels like church like watching all of these people like mosh or like run around this room and, and just like go crazy on these like drops you know like with this band and the band taking us on the on a journey like I felt like I was in church and I remember being young thinking like oh this must be what God is like you know this feeling of togetherness and like oneness that happens when music is being played and emotions are being like accurately represented and interpreted and felt by the players and the people in the room you know and I, I fell in love with that whatever that was and I wanted to learn how to do it <laughs> myself. Um, when I think about like church music and like making music now, and I mean, I, I feel like it all came from the same place with me. Like I wanted to understand like how I could make people feel like they were all one organism <laughs> um, through music. And cause that's how it made me feel when I was in church or when I was at shows, like I felt like I fit there and, I think that's a powerful thing that music can do. So, yeah. That's a fascinating parallel you drew there. That You know, the first time you went into a hardcore show and saw everyone moshing, it felt like church. It makes you wonder, is that, do you think part of that is where, you know, when a musician says they're channeling God when they write music, is that maybe part of where that connection comes from? Is that the energy that's kind of linking those two things together? I mean, I believe that. I mean, I've always grew up kind of believing that, like, music is, is really a gift, you know? Like, some people are, are truly gifted to do it, you know, like, Shoot, like, I mean, Stevie Wonder, like, that dude is like a, a gift from God. <laughs> like, if God is real, like, I mean, it explains Stevie Wonder, you know, it explains, like, 
Aretha Franklin or, you know, any Elvis, you know, in all these people, you know, who, you know, just like transcended like t space, time and music <laughs> with their art. You know, I do believe that, you know, there's something there, something cosmic that there that's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, those people you mentioned as well, they almost become deities in the eyes of some people as well. They kind of become these figures that we look up to and and hold in this weird kind of elevated light in a similar way. Definitely. Yeah. Demigods. When you first started playing in bands, was it that kind of hardcore music you were making or what sort of thing were you drawn to initially when you began performing? Like heavy music, um, hardcore stuff, post-hardcore stuff. Um, but I also, it was so funny, I was always doing like three things at once. So like, I remember like playing in my first few hardcore bands, um, but I was also playing like guitar and like country bands and like folk projects. And I was always like making beats, you know, so um, I felt like I was always like, doing a lot of different things but um it all kind of made sense to me like i you know loved it all and i just wanted to like i'm still like this like when i hear something that i like like i just want to know how to make it like i i'm like how do you do that and i i practice it and so yeah <laughs> I, I hope that answers your question yeah it's interesting as well you know we think about music and some of what you've just been saying there is it brings us closer to the people when you kind of enter that environment like a show how did that function with your family, though, if they were quite religious? Did it kind of bring you closer to them in the same way, or did it cause any friction there with you performing this music? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, no. I think my parents were probably a little worried. You know, they were like, yo, like, you still need to have a job. So, <laughs> you know, like, I think that was more their concern was just, like, make sure you can take care of yourself. Um, but no, like, my mom and dad, like, they love what I do, and they're, like, so supportive and... We're all older now. They know I don't go to church. They're cool with it. Like, I'm sure my mom wishes I would, but it's all good. She She's fine with it. But yeah, they, you know, they love the music. And, you know, my parents, they grew up in the 70s, so they were doing the same shit I'm doing right now. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> yeah. At what point did you start to move away from church? When I moved out of my house. Like most people, I went to college, started making friends, you know, just grew up started doing other things with my time you know that was that's really all it is mm -hmm. so you're so you grew up in oklahoma where do you move when you first go to college um i went to the first i got a football scholarship to play in uh, kansas so i went to emporia state and played football and hated it and quit and i moved back to oklahoma and uh went to school at a community college and then Went to the University of Oklahoma where my mom taught me um, voice, you know, in the vo on the vocal faculty. Stayed there at University of Oklahoma, and then I moved to D.C. Um, shortly after for, like, my first internship. And I was just working in D.C. and eventually moved to New York, started playing in bands and, you know, just bouncing around a lot. And now I'm back in D.C. Mm -hmm. How long have you been in D.C. for this time? I'm going on two years now. Is that the the longest you've kind of been settled over that period where you're moving around a lot or um no um i've been i mean i was in new york for almost five years so i guess that was probably my longest stint somewhere after like you know living with my parents but yeah how have those different cities kind of impacted your creativity when you're living in them is it quite different for each one or is it as a creativity a constant that kind of overrides that well i feel like i was making different things in different cities like when i first moved to dc i didn't really know anybody um but i i just made beats in my room like i i was actually like trying i was trying to figure out where music fit in my life like i was like i said like just young and just kind of moved away and was trying to figure my life out so i was, I was working a lot and music wasn't really like the focal point of my life but when i got a little more settled i just realized how empty like my life felt without it and that kind of spurred my move to new york because i wanted to play in bands and so i you know quit that job that i had in dc moved to new york got a different job and just started to play in like pretty relentlessly for a while um that was when i started you know i you know i played everything in every band i could like drums bass guitar singing like I just went for it <laughs> and um, that was like a good almost five years and then I moved back here um, and now that I'm back here and like I'm a little more focused on my, my music and I've got a studio now like you know I'm doing a lot more but um, it's very different than the first time I was in DC where 
I was just making beats in my bedroom after work, you know. Does it feel different as a city as well? Or is it more just has been an internal kind of personal change? Nah, I don't know. I mean, it's different as a city. I mean, DC's got, it, it hadn't really changed much. I mean, rapidly gentrifying, you know, American city. Um, I feel like personally, I have grown a lot in terms of just like knowing what I want to do with my life and being more secure in that idea than I was when I was 22. 21 years old you know I'm 31 now so 10 years ago when I was here like I was just in a very different headspace like trying to understand who well, how I fit into the world and uh now I'm kind of like I'll build my own world <laughs> so <laughs> yeah I mean that's what the record's about really isn't it because you kind of on it on it you escape Mustang is kind of what it insinuates but then you discover that you've fallen in to a whole bunch of new traps and then you realize that i mean life's kind of just you can't really escape it you kind of just like you say have to create something for yourself exactly yeah and uh, thank you for saying that that's exactly what the record is about i'm gonna steal that that's like the best way it's been explained i wish i explained <laughs> it that way <laughs> but yeah um that's exactly what it is and uh yeah like the record was all about just like it was like an actualization like i was like oh i i want i'm just gonna build the thing i want for me period and if people like it they can come you know <laughs> that's kind of been like the operating like idea and it's been fruitful you know so what role did creating music play in you kind of then creating your own identity were they kind of things that were in parallel once you realized that and you realized you were going to try and construct something did that then tie into your identity as well or? yeah um i th that's an interesting question let me see like how do i how do i for, like answer that um I think it was coming back to like who I actually was. I felt like throughout my life, I was always in situations where I had to like pare down who I was or be like a piece of myself. And I, and I, and I remember, man, like I remember like things were going really well in my life, like professionally. And I just looked in the mirror one day and I was like, I don't even recognize myself. Like, who am I? Do I even like this? You know, like I was like, do I even know what I like? Like, who, what is, what am I? You know, I, I had lost myself over the years trying to make everyone around me feel safe or happy or, you know, I just, I forgot who I was. And then when I, that was kind of around the time when I made the decision to move to Brooklyn and I moved there and met so many artists that were like black, young, queer, you know, from all over the world, um, from Brooklyn who were like me, you know, and it was the first time I'd been around people like that and I felt like it was okay to be myself and it was okay to want the things that I wanted out of life. Like I couldn't even vocalize, like to say that I wanted to be a songwriter at that point in my life. Like I just, I, that felt so presumptive, you know, I mean, to, to, to want that from the world, you know, to say, I want to be a, a, a person who writes music for a living, you know, like I, I felt like that didn't happen to actual normal people, you know, like, and it definitely wouldn't happen for me. You know, I, I didn't believe in myself at all at that point in my life. But when I realized that there were a lot of people like me that were doing it and like making just like amazing stuff, like inspiring music, inspiring visual art, you know, I, I, I just, I, I had to be a part of it. It was like the only thing in my life that I felt like was me, you know, and had always been me and was a part of me that I had suppressed for so long for whatever reason. So when I decided that I was going to start making Live Forever and the 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 music around it and, you know, it just it was a coming at a time where I was also deciding that I was going to start putting myself first and start, you know, doing the things that I felt like were true to the things I really want out of life for myself and for like my future. You know, um, I, I was just like, yo, man, I, don't, I don't care about like making money or like having like a solid job anymore like it just sucked the life out of me if I'm not doing this one thing that I know I'm supposed to be doing you know and so yeah I mean that's kind of how it's the music is related to to who I am and like the world I'm trying to build for myself you know it's a it's very freeing yeah mm -hmm. why did you feel that barrier was there in the first place that you couldn't call yourself a songwriter? What what kind of caused that to form? I don't know. I think I 
I, you know, I'm from like a working class family and I always kind of grew up with the idea that like I needed to just like get a job and get married and just like be a solid person, you know, just like, just like play it straight, you know, and that was kind of, I, and I also grew up in a place that was very conservative, very white, um, you know, it, it's a, you know, You've, I mean, racism in America is a very, you know, <laughs> very prominent thing. Um, and I grew up in one of the most conservative states in, in, the, in the country. And just like the, some of the things that my family went through, you know, black people here, you know, we're kind of like raised to p- parts of our life to, you know, really like keep to ourselves and just kind of like keep your head down, stay out of trouble and like don't get put yourself in any situations that you could end up getting like hurt or put in jail or accused of something or killed or anything like, um, and that kind of shit happens where I'm from, you know, like it's, it's the South, you know? And so it's like just legacies of fear and like survival mode at all times. And, uh, I think that that combination of things, plus like being in a very religious household, I, I, I put limits on myself you know, because I wanted to make people happy. I'm I'm very much a people pleaser and definitely was when I was younger. You know, I, I always put my feelings and the things that I wanted aside to try and like make parents happy or do what I was, what I thought I was supposed to do. Um, but as I got older, I just kind of realized that that shit, that was kind of bullshit. Like, you know, my parents just wanted to see me happy. I just want to be happy, you know, like, <laughs> and the only thing that makes me happy is working on music. And, and building things like this, you know, it's so, you know. I mean, you can't make other people happy until you're happy yourself. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and I wasn't. And I also, like, didn't realize that I wasn't. It was almost as if I never was happy. Like, I was just always trying to fit into someone else's idea for who I was instead of just, like, doing what I wanted. And uh took a long time <laughs> for me to just, like, wake up and be like, what do you want, man? Like, what what do you want out of all this? The very thankful to Brooklyn and all the people I met there that helped me realize that, you know. Do you still collaborate with any of them in your music? Yeah, they're all in my band. <laughs> 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 yeah, we we make all of our records together and we support each other. Like they have bands too, you know. So it's that's like my family, you know. Um, it's just like a bunch of people up there in Brooklyn, you know, that have been making, you know, that make a Felicia Douglas who sings in Dirty Projectors, like. One of, like a collaborator that I, I really look up to and admire, um, Taja Cheek, um, who plays for Lorraine, um, you know, Teeny, who played in the band Teen. Um, there's just some, inc- you know, obviously there are some great players in Brooklyn, but like there are some people up there that I really admire and who have been like formidable in how I've like shifted my thinking about what I was capable of doing. It's crazy the effect that when you surround yourself, you know, with people that inspire you and that you look up to, it's crazy the kind of subconscious effect that has like on your own, you know, persona in your own life. And you don't even realize it. Totally, totally. It's just like clarifying, you know, like you can see, you can see more clearly, (laughs) I think. How do you stay true to your own artistic vision? Or is it harder to stay true to your own artistic vision when you're a people pleaser, like you were saying earlier? I mean, it has been. Um, It's funny, like, Five years ago, I remember being in a studio for a session and like it just didn't go well at all. Like I I felt like they were kind of condescending towards me and they didn't really let me get my ideas in. And I felt super disrespected. But then I was also like, I'm going to teach myself how to do all this shit so I never have to need anyone ever again (laughs) to like help me do something I want to do. And I think that got me out of being such a people pleaser because I didn't have to please anyone in the studio. Like, I was like, I'm running the session. Like, is all this is mine. <laughs> like, we're gonna do what I wanna do. Um, and so, but yeah, I I always have to like, kind of gut check myself when I'm writing songs to be like, okay, why am I saying this? Like, did I hear this on the radio? Is that why I'm saying it? Like, am I saying this because I think people will react well to it? I think there are points where that's smart, but like, it's balanced. Like, Every song has something for me and something for everybody else, too. Um, so I'm trying to keep it that way. Mm-hmm. Is that the question you ask yourself most throughout the process? Just why? Or 
Are there other questions that kind of pop up frequently for you when you're making music? The biggest question that pops up to me is, is this good at all? Like, is this good? <laughs> <laughs> Would you listen to this, Bartiz? You know, like, I, you know, like, I really do love the idea of, like, people should make the art that they want to see in the world. Um, but I feel like I make stuff that I already see. Like, I'm just, like, doing it my way, I guess. Like, I, I, I feel like I'm... People definitely can hear my references in my music really clearly. Um, but so I don't know. That's a good question. What are some questions I ask myself? Mostly like, yo, is this shit good or not? Like, <laughs> like I, that's really the biggest one. <laughs> um, and when I'm like really early in writing a song, I have this thing where I'm like, yo, like, what's the nut? Like, what is the song? Like, in all of this orchestration and instrumentation and the arrangement, like, what is the song like hinging on? Like, is it this like turnaround? Is it this phrase? Is it this guitar line? Is it this vocal hook? Like, what is the thing that makes the song the song? Now let's peel everything back and like start over. You know, like I want that to be so clear. I love like like the national, for example, or like anything Aaron Desner produces. There's like a clarity to it, like a focus to the music that I feel like I can feel. Um, and I, I try to capture that, but you know, I hope I'm getting better at it. Like I'm, I hope that I continue to, but, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Can there be like multiple moments in a song that it kind of hinges on? Cause I mean, the tunes that you write, they twist and turn so much through different genres and styles and sections. Are there multiple moments in a song that feel quite key or is it always one thing that you kind of hinge it around? I like to think that there's one thing that I hinge it around. And it's so funny, like, um, how people have said that I like genre bend and stuff. Cause I, Yes, I agree with that, but I never try to do that. Like, that's not ever, like, a focal point of the song. I'm never like, ooh, I want to write, like, a country song with, like, a rap verse in it. Like, I never go into the song that way. I just write the song, and I'm like, oh, this this is this is sick. Like, I want to do this, you know, and and that's it, you know. I just do the things that feel natural to me, and... um I feel like I can perform everything that I write on an acoustic guitar. Like that's kind of like where it all starts um, for me. So I don't know when I'm looking for the song in the song, it's it's it feels easy for me to see. Um, I, I guess by the time I've produced it and released it, everyone's hearing like a fully fledged out like vision with a bunch of things. But like to me, like I hear all of those songs as like really small moments, like really small things that I'm building the entire song around. That's how it like always starts. I mean, I think you kind of captured the the essence of it there though in your answer as well, in that you don't try and hop through these genres and that's what makes it so appealing and gives it the sense of, moment, the sense of momentum is that it is completely organic and there's no sense of artifice about it. It just twists and turns. Like it, it, as if you were writing a song that stays in the one genre, it just happens that it kind of hops about a little bit. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, definitely. Is that just your intuition that you're trusting there to kind of tell you where to take it? Or what are you kind of relying upon to maintain a certain perspective so that you can answer that question that you ask yourself, is this good? And you know that you can you can say yes with certainty. I just trust, yo, know, I mean, I think that taste is everything. And I think that great artists like have immaculate taste. And like, I, I feel like I have good taste <laughs> personally. Like, I mean, I'm not like a, I'm really not a great musician. I'm also like not the best. I'm a good singer, but like, I know singers that would tear the, tear me to pieces, you know, like I'm not the best at anything. Um, but I do feel like I have a really broad range of influences. And when I hear something that I think is good, I feel like it's good, you know? And so I trust my ears. Like I don't know music theory at all. I write a lot of things that when I bring it into a studio, people say, oh, this doesn't work, but it works. You know, like they'll be like, these notes don't go together, but somehow it's working. And I'm like, yeah, like it sounds good to me, you know, and and that's like where I go, like all like all the way. It's always I'm always like, what's the vibe? Did I capture it? Does it sound good? Period. And and I don't think much like I, I know I have friends who like think so much about their music. <laughs> like, you know, they write a song and they just belabor it for like a year, two years, three years, you know? And I've never been like that. Like, I I really believe that like, I'm, I'm trying to capture like a vibe, like an emotion. And that, and if the arrangement is good and production is good enough and I'm clear on like what the message is of the song, 
I can capture it. And like, it doesn't matter if I'm doing it with a band or with like a couple spoons and some plates. Like, I feel like <laughs> I can like capture the vibe. And um, that's kind of like how I've approached the music. And I don't really get hung up on anything. Like if it feels good, I'm like, dope, stamp, let's move forward. You know, like, I don't know. I think that's like a big part of that whole thing. Does that lend the music a certain energy as well? I think it does. Like, I think it feels purposeful, but like raw, you know, like nothing in my eyes, like it feels like mistakes are being made, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, you know, it's not like super polished, but it's, it's fine. Like the song is good, you know. Is that something you have to build to? Were you always in a kind of position where you could be comfortable with little mistakes or is it something you kind of come to with time? It's something I came to with time. I definitely used to like beat, beat the shit out of songs, like just run them over and over and over again, trying to make them perfect. But then, you know, I just started to think about just like my favorite music and a lot of it isn't perfect. I really like like character rich songs and also thinking about like production as an artistic flourish in itself. Like not every song needs to sound like physical by Dua Lipa. Like making that song sound so crisp and so like open faced, like every instrument is just like hitting and just like just like the the cleanliness and the neatness of that sound um it doesn't apply well to like mustang or boomer or like stone meadows i like to think of like everything you can do to a song as like an artistic choice all the way to like the production quality once i kind of got my head around that i was like cool well like there are some songs that i might like spend more time on but for a lot of other songs like it should feel like something that just like fell out of my body like you know, like Moss Blurred is just like, blah, like, blah, <laughs> you know, like, it's just, <laughs> that's all it is. Like, that was the emotion I wanted to get out, just like, blah, and, and I, you know, that song took like 45 minutes to make. That's it. That's it. You know, and I made it and like, move on. We're moving on to the next one. That's a really complicated soundscape as well, though, on that one. There's a lot of stuff going on in it. Oh, it, if you, you, yo, man. You may think it is, but there's nothing. There's, like, so little going on in that song. Like, it's, like, huge metal guitars. And then, like, a big bass synth pad. And then I resampled it onto one pad. And I'm just triggering everything at the same time. It's classic Dilla resample technique. Just on, off, on, off. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's one of my favorite songs I've ever written. That song was dope because when I read it, when I wrote it, I was like, damn, I'm really getting good at this. Cause I, I like, I made all the decisions so fast. You know, I was like, I was like, oh, I want it to sound like this, this, and this. I'm going to record it. Boom, boom, boom. And it was done. And I was like, damn, is this what like Quincy Jones feels like every time he writes a song? He just like, knows what it is like days before he write, makes it I felt i felt really good about that song <laughs> the thing i like about it as well is that it works on two levels because you could look at it about what we've just been speaking about and trying to put artists into a genre but then there's also that kind of undercurrent of it being about the dangers of stereotyping in general and it kind of functions on both of those you know platforms in parallel yeah definitely i mean that was definitely my like hope for that song so yeah how how conscious were you of the way that you portrayed your family on this record as well because i mean there's references across it to you you know father and you know immediate family but on that song as well you kind of speak about your nephew a little bit yeah i mean my family is like the my biggest insecurity probably um like just you know i always wish i was closer to him and you know families are weird man and like as you get older you just like you're trying to figure out how things make sense but people are getting older and dying and stuff like you feel like you have time but you don't have time and that's always been something i've struggled with like how do i do all the things i want to do and make sure that i'm close enough to the people who actually matter to me you know like how do i make them feel like they matter to me like how do i how do i matter to them you know how do i be there for them you know it's something I've struggled with as I've moved across the country and pursued all of these things, you know, knowing that I'm missing things back home. And, <clears throat> and so, yeah, like, I think like writing about my family is something that'll probably always be in my music, but Moss Blurred specifically, like, 
I was trying to depict how black people can be hurt by like genres and you know how people of color when you see something I mean this is such a corny and like lame argument but like I, I mean it happened to me like you grow up you see the same thing on tv every day about your whole race of people like you start to believe that that is what your role is in society almost, you know, like it's like, which in some senses isn't horrible, but it can be limiting and it can make people who don't want to do those things feel like they don't have a place. Like for me, I was like, I don't see any kids or grownups on TV that are doing things that I want to do. That's why I couldn't say, I wanted to be a songwriter or a musician because I just never saw it. Like, I didn't think it was a reality for a black kid growing up in Mustang, Oklahoma to want to be like anything, you know? And so, <laughs> like, I guess like when I like that song in Lost Blair, like I'm kind of talking about how like, like, you know, my brother, my oldest brother was in prison for a long time. And like his son, you know, I, I'm watching him like repeat a lot of the same mistakes, you know? And I'm like, damn, like, I attribute this to, like, the way that black people are told that we need to, like, be in society and how society is so unforgiving to, like, black people as we figure out who we are and try to find ourselves in this country, specifically America. You know, it's a it's a mess. How much older than you is your brother? My oldest brother probably 16 years older so was he in prison while you were growing up were you quite young when that was going on yeah did you feel his absence did you kind of have memories of him being in the house and then he he no longer was there or yeah yeah i mean that's that's yeah exactly it <laughs> you know um he was around and then he just wasn't around you know and then you know a few years ago i saw him again like for the first time in a long time and it was nice and he's back around a little bit but um you know Prison is crazy, man. <laughs> like it's, well, especially in the states, yeah. It changes people, and um, you know, I miss him for for you know for who he was. You know, it's wild. I guess it comes back to as well what you were saying earlier about trying to matter to your family. How I mean, how do you reconnect? How do you begin to try and reconnect with someone like that after they've been away in a spell like that and they've come back different? I don't know. You always have this thing about like, do you want to? You know, you're like, do I wanna? Like, do I know this person anymore? Have they changed? You know. There's all that. Um, but, you know, like, every time I'm around him, I'm like, oh, shit, you're my brother. Like, it's all good. <laughs> you know? like, um, to, And that's, like, something that, like, in my life, I'm, like, a, a huge overthinker. And um, normally, like, go into situations expecting the worst. And 99% of the time, it's way better than I thought it would be. So... You're, that's also like a big theme in the record. My like drum, my me being dramatic as hell always. I'm definitely the drama kid in my family, um, the one that's like, oh my god, what's wrong? And everyone's like, it's fine, <laughs> you know. So, you know, it's it's I don't know some a whole bunch of things stirred up in there. It's curious how you're a huge overthinker, but then you can write a song like Mosbler in like thirty or forty five minutes. Did you say? Yeah, well, I'm an overthinker with people, but when with music, like, it's mine. Like, that's the one thing in the world that, like, I'm sure about, you know? Like, everything else is kind of hard, <laughs> hard to navigate. That's possibly, well, that probably is why you struggled so much without it, and you kind of felt that hole in your life because you didn't have that security that it offers, maybe. I think that's 100% true. Um, yeah, music is, like, the one thing in the world that's mine, you know? Everything else is, like, not. <laughs> I mean, how long did you have that, that, how long did you feel like there was a hole where it wasn't present for? What were we talking, like, in a time span for that period? I mean, like, you know, it's kind of weird to answer that question because I always wanted to do it, but I, I just had to make money and work and go to school and, you know, just normal people things, you know? Like, I always wanted to pursue music, but there was really no possible way for me to do so in my early 20s. Like, you know, 18 to, like, 26, 27, 28 years old, like... I was just trying to stay afloat, you know, um, working and playing in bands and slugging it out, you know. Um, it, I'm 31 now. I mean, really wasn't until like this summer where I was like, okay, like this is working. <laughs> I can like, <laughs> I can pot, like I might get a job in a studio and like produce for a living, you know, like if I can find it, you know. And 
some people gave me a really amazing studio to work out of. And that's what I've been doing the last four months, um, which is pretty sweet. Um, it's the first time I've not had a full time job and I'm still getting used to it. A part of me is like, when is this going to end? And I'll have to go back to my life that I don't like, you know, like I'm like horrified <laughs> of like this not really being my life which is a weird thing to say but um but yeah things are going really well like it's the happiest i've ever been i don't know weird yeah it can be hard to enjoy things in the moment like you're sitting there when that that kind of pressure is lingering over the top of it that this could and how do you kind of overcome that and move past it and be able to let you say enjoy the kind of happiest period of your life well one thing i've been thinking about a lot is like i've always said this and my mom said this to me when i was like a a, a kid like i remember asking my mom like mom like do you wish you were famous like do you wish you like you know well da, 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 like with music and she was like i know that i'm gonna do this whether it's five people or five thousand people or five million people like i'm just always gonna do this so you know, doesn't matter. And and that's kind of like how I'm thinking about it now too. Whereas I'm like, you know, this is awesome. Like I'm going to do everything I can to like keep doing this and keep making this the main thing I do. But, you know, it, like I understand how things work <clears throat> in the real world <laughs> and, you know, things change and I may need to like go back and like hit a job for six months to pay bills. But that doesn't mean I'm not a musician anymore. You know, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it just means I'm, like, surviving like everybody else. And I'm okay with that idea, you know. Um, so, you know, it's something I think a lot about now. But whatever happens, <clears throat> I think I'll be fine with it because I don't feel defined by it anymore. Like, I feel like like I'm confident enough in myself to – I know who I am and, and, ex and what I am and – where I want to be long term. So if that means, you know, I got to go back and pick up a job to pay some bills for a little while, it's okay cuz it's all getting me closer to the thing I want, you know. Does knowing who you are then and who you want to be with that clarity, does that lend a certain focus to your kind of creativity and your in the way that you can push your music in different directions and evolve it? I hope it will. <laughs> I'm uh, you know, like I said, like I'm looking at a lot of music right now like for the next thing and Someone, like, said some shit the other day that really annoyed me, where they were like, oh, well, you know, people have their whole life to write their first album and, you know, a year to write their second one, so good luck. Almost to infer, like, get ready to have a shitty album. And I was like, chill. Like, the thing's going to be great. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, it's so funny. Like, I was like, yeah, man, like, it's still me writing the shit. Like, it's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do believe in my like I believe you know I'm like yeah like I think I know how to make a good song so I'm I'm not worried anymore about that stuff I don't know if I necessarily agree with the idea that you have your whole life to write your first record because I mean, if we look at the record you just put out for example a lot of what you're kind of articulating in that although the evolution is a product of your whole life most of it's kind of coming from like the end of your 20s it seems like and the kind of revelations you had around that time yeah totally mm -hmm. and it's interesting like you know, someone else asked me recently, like, oh, like, what's it like to do this record so late in your life? And, like, it's a shame that you couldn't have done it when you were earlier, in, like, in your 20s. And I've been thinking about that a lot because I'm like, there's no way I could have written this record when, when I was 24. Like, I just hadn't lived the shit or, like, had those realizations until I was, like, older, you know? And I feel like a similar thing will happen for the next album, like... The things that I'm experiencing from like, you know, 28 to 31 or 32, like that shit will probably be what I write about, you know. And I feel like as long as I'm like writing about things that actually happened and I'm not trying to like just do stuff to feed the beast or whatever, like I'll be OK, you know. What were you writing songs about when you were 24? Oh, I was just mad. <laughs> I, was, I was mad when I was younger. I was mad I wasn't rich. I was mad that people had stuff I didn't have. I was mad that like I didn't know who I was and I was everyone was so well adjusted and so free and I had lived this life of like fear not even knowing I was scared. You know, I was like I was playing in hardcore bands literally yelling my ears like ye yelling my throat to death like touring the northeast in hardcore bands from like 20 four to 29 
you know, <laughs> so it was like, that was what I was doing. Um, but at the same time, like playing another stuff too, but I was just trying to like excise demons, I think, like get it out of my system, clearing my, my head. Um, that's how, that's what it felt like. Is that, you know, playing in hardcore bands and kind of exercising that, is that partly what kind of led to the, the kind of the visceral outburst thing your vocals do at the end of Mustang? You know, kind of right at the close of that song. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Has your relationship to your voice then changed over the years and the way you kind of use it and what you want to do with it? Your actual singing voice? Um, I used to be really ashamed of it. Like, I was like, oh man, like, I sound, and you know, I'll be honest, like, I was like, oh, I sound too black. Like, no one's going to like my songs. Like, none of the white people, you know, I've, like, because I was writing a lot of hardcore music and punk music, and I was like, no one's going to like hearing, like, a church vocalist sing over this stuff, you know, so I was really insecure about my voice, and I tried to sound like other people for a really long time, um, but then I was like, this is dumb, <laughs> I need to just do my thing, um, I'm glad I made that decision. But yeah, now, you know, I take way better care of my voice. Um, but, you know, there was it was a journey. I was like, I wasn't sure if it was good for a while. You take better care of it in terms of just doing vocal exercises and stuff? Or in, in, what, in what sense? Yeah, I'm just like nicer to it. I don't smoke as much weed. <laughs> 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 I do more edibles. <laughs> I like... <laughs> I will modulate a song down if I feel like it's too high. <laughs> I don't scream anymore like I used to. Like I was really like scream, like seriously screaming, going crazy in basements for years, you know. So my mom was just like horrified. She was like, "You're gonna ruin your voice. Please, please stop." <laughs> but yeah, what a trip. Now that you're, you know, like you're saying, you've overcome that and you're comfortable performing in your own voice and and having it as it is. How do you kind of balance that when you're putting effects on it so you don't lose the personality at the heart of it? Like on something like Ghostly, you know, the start of that. Um, I don't know. Like, just kind of going with my gut. Like, I have a bunch of great examples. I mean, I love Justin Vernon and James Blake's vocal tracking. Like, I love how their voices sound on records. And, um, and it's because they have great voices, you know? Like, they have a great voice and they do creative things with it. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to depend on like the strength of my voice and I'll do things that I think are cool, but like, I think my voice is good enough to hold it together and just trusting my instrument, you know, um, that's really it. To come back to, um, that song ghostly as well, that I kind of just mentioned there at the end of it, it's an interesting one because it feels like actually firstly, after you do those effects and the raw vocals come in, they hit really hard. And as a result of that, it kind of feels like an ascension, but what you're speaking about it, is less so it's kind of the most straight up and honest and kind of direct you've been it's almost confessional in some ways yeah that's a, yeah man that's a, like right on the money is that is that like, a fair assessment or they're the song like the whole record is kind of like dancing around a couple of themes and then there are two songs on the record that are just like this is how i feel <laughs> you know like must like moss blurred is one and ghostly is the other one where it's very plain speak you know like it's about being lonely and <clears throat> living a whole life feeling like you have to make something alone because no one understands what you're trying to do. Like, and at the end where it's like, I feel ghostly bad and it's not because I miss a girl or like, it's not because of anything like that. It's because I feel like I miss myself. Like I want to know who I am. And, and that's, that's like the quest of the record is like actual actualization and feeling like once you find that person, you, you feel untouchable, like you can live forever. Like, you know, it, you almost feel like God, like you can build anything you want, you know? And that's kind of like what where the song, where the record ends is like how I still feel ghostly. Like I still feel like I'm actualizing, like I'm becoming myself but I'm starting as a ghost, <laughs> like, and, and becoming who I am from that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, re the record then almost becomes like a process of you discovering your own identity, a product of you finding your identity. Yeah, exactly. Exactly.